All righty, if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, I want to invite you to join me in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, if you're just joining us today, the way that we preach here is we take a book of the Bible and we work our way through it, verse by verse, asking these questions, what, is this, what does this mean? What, what did it mean then? How does this apply to our lives today? And how does this ultimately point us to the Son of God, Jesus Christ? And today we are at 1 Samuel chapter 16, and starting next week, we get into one of the most famous passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. I think we're going to take about maybe three weeks to work through it, but that is the story of David and Goliath, and I'm really excited about that. That is starting next week. So in our house, um, you know, growing up, all of our kids have enjoyed watching the movie The Lion King. Great movie, great cartoon. It was a a new movie that came out as well, The Lion King. But in that movie, we have a couple of characters, m many characters, but the two characters that stand out for us today, King Mufasa and his brother Scar. King Mufasa, he was the, the king of the land. He was the, the king of, of the lion tribe, very well-respected king, very well-respected leader. And then who do we see? The opposite of that. We see his wicked brother Scar, uh, an evil, evil brother, a brother who was uh, very jealous of Mufasa. And what does Scar do in the movie? Well, Scar, he becomes so jealous of his brother Mufasa that Scar kills his brother. And what we see in that movie essentially are two siblings who go the completely opposite of directions. And this is what we see in the text that we're looking at today, we see two different people going in two completely different directions, Saul and David. So first of all, this morning, let's look at Saul's situation. Let's look at Saul's situation. It says, sorry, oh, I'll get into the text in just a few moments. So the, the children of Israel had rejected God and they chose Saul as their king. We, we remember that from previous texts. And, and God in his grace said to Saul and to the children of Israel, he said then to this after their rejection, he said, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you, talking about Saul, will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. And this was God's graceful promise to Saul and to the Israelites. When they were turning their back on God, God in his grace essentially said, okay, if you... And the king, that, that Saul, will follow me. It will be well for you. If not, then my hand will be against you. And this was a very uh, simple and straightforward promise from God. And, and what does Saul do? Well, we remember what Saul does. Saul disregards the command of God in every single way. Saul would be told by God to do something and Saul would go and do the opposite. And God fulfilled his promise to Saul. We, we will eventually see that God goes on to reject Saul from being king over Israel. Samuel told Saul, For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. So that gets us to this point in today's text. And David was anointed as the next king over Israel. And then we pick it up in today's text in verse 14 and 15. It says, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. So we see that Saul goes from being empowered by God's Spirit to do a task to now having God's Spirit removed from him. And we also see in the text that a harmful spirit 
is tormenting him. So we have to ask this question, what in the world is going on here? What does all of this mean? Does, does this mean that God will remove his spirit from people today? And the answer is no. The answer is no. But for Saul, in, in this context, in this time period, it meant that God removed the power and anointing given to Saul from God to lead. We see God removing that anointing from Saul. That's what's going on here in this text. One theologian writes, Saul had received God's spirit at the time of his anointing by Samuel. We saw that in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10. This does not mean that Saul had been born again to a saving faith, but rather that God's spirit was providing him with a supernatural equipping for the calling that God had given him. And now, all of this was lost. God had empowered Saul with this supernatural anointing. Saul goes off and does his own thing, and now all of this was lost because Saul chose to reject God. The text also says this, that a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. But what was that? What, what was this harmful spirit? Spirit, as I was studying this past week, I come, came to realize that there's many different theories or, or thoughts as to what this harmful spirit was. One theologian by the name of Warren Wiersbe, he, he says that this was an evil spirit that God allowed to torment Saul as a part of his discipline because of Saul's rebellion. Other theologians say that the spirit was, was not an evil spirit, Except that it was, it was an angel, and said it was an angel, but it was an angel of judgment. One theologian writes that the spirit, presumably an angel, was not himself evil, but rather he was sent by the Lord to bring harm upon Saul. But regardless of what the spirit was, commentators all agree that this harmful spirit was sent by the Lord as an act of judgment on Saul's sin. This harmful spirit was, was sent by God because of Saul's disobedience. And now we see that Saul is suffering the consequences of his actions. He's suffering the consequences of his actions. He, he goes and he, and he sins against God. And we saw in previous weeks that he, he has these superficial repentance, times of repentance, but it's not a true repentance. He never truly repents of his sin. And we see now that Saul is miserable. He's a miserable person. And we'll see it in coming weeks that he goes on to become an even more miserable and, and jealous person. Speaking of becoming miserable, these past several weeks, the heat has made me miserable. Anybody else looking forward to the, the cool weather that's coming this week? I'm so looking forward to the, the fall weather that's coming. I do not like the heat. You see, church family, when people reject God and choose not to repent of their sin, eventually they become miserable. When people reject God and choose not to confess their sin or to make it right with God and to turn their backs on God, Eventually, they'll become miserable. You see, church family, one cannot have a true joy in their life apart from the giver of life, God. And if I had to say that this is the, the main point that I want us to understand this morning, it would be this. It would be this, that, that one cannot have true joy, a joy that brings peace and and satisfaction. One cannot have a true joy in their life apart from the giver of life, God. C.S. Lewis is the one who said, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. And this is what we see going on here with Saul. He eventually becomes so miserable. Why does he become miserable? Because he turns his back on God. Therefore, no peace, no happiness, no joy whatsoever. Just like the song says, 
Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So first of all, in this text, we see this situation that Saul finds himself in. Next, we see David's situation. Next, we see David's situation. So when Saul was disobedient to God, Samuel told him, 1 Samuel chapter 13, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And this is talking about David, the, the future coming king who would, who would eventually replace Saul as king. David, God's chosen king. And then we saw last week that, that Samuel anointed David to be the next king over Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So, in other words, God's Spirit was there to stay with David. You see, church family, as we're looking at two different people going in two completely different directions, we had one man who was rejecting God, one man who had rejected God, but David, much different than Saul. Much different. The Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. This was said about David in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. For the Lord sees, not as man sees, but man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God saw David's heart. He had a heart that followed God. He had a heart that, that loved God. And think about this. God brings David from tending his father's sheep to now ministering to Saul with music to being anointed as the next king over Israel. You see, God saw David's heart. I want to read again verse 16. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. And that's the, that's the key text here. The Lord was with him. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey, laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat, and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. And so Saul was refreshed and was well and the harmful spirit departed from him. Again, two different people going in two completely different directions. Saul goes from being king over all of the land, king over God's chosen people, to rejecting God, to becoming a miserable person. And David goes from his father's field to ministering to Saul. And then God preparing him to be the next king over Israel. And we have to ask this question and answer this question as we see this huge difference between these two people, Saul and David. And the question is this, what was the difference? Well, we know the answer. The text tells us. We had it underlined there a few moments ago. What was the difference? You see, the Lord was with David, as the text tells us in 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. The Lord is with him. The Lord was with him. This is the difference, church family. The Lord was with David. The Lord was with him. And the que here's the question we must ask. Why was the Lord with David? Why was the Lord with David? Here's the reason why. Because David was with God. David sought after God. David loved God. David was a man after God's own heart. David walked with God and Saul did not. The Lord was with 
him. And this is a key theme in the Bible for those whom God used. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joshua. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And also a major theme in the book of Sam, 1 Samuel, God honors those who honor him. God honors those who honor him. God said in um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So it begs this question for us this morning, looking at this text and looking at two different people going in two completely different directions. What's the application for us today? I believe that there's much application. And I want to give us just, just three application points for us to consider based on what we see going on in this text today. And the first application point is this. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by His Spirit. You see, church family, the Bible makes it very clear that whenever we trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and we, we bow our lives to His Lordship, we confess Him as Lord, the Bible makes it very clear that His Spirit, as, as New Testament believers living in the New Covenant, that His Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. The Apostle Paul said it like this in Ephesians chapter 1. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, he says, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's the idea of the Spirit coming to dwell inside of you. Whenever you believe upon the gospel, Believe in Jesus Christ, the Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. And now we, we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. His Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. And then the Bible tells us, the Bible calls us that whenever His Spirit comes to dwell inside of us, now as New Testament believers, we are called to walk within that Spirit. We are called to follow the Spirit that God has placed to dwell inside of us. The Apostle Paul also wrote in Galatians chapter 5, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the, spirit desires, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit." So it begs this question, how do we do that? How do we keep in step with the Spirit? You see, keeping in step with the Spirit is the idea of following the Spirit. It's the idea of doing what the Spirit of God prompts us to do. It's, it's obeying the Word of God. This is how we keep in step with the Spirit, by, by reading the Word of God and listening to what the Word of God says and, and doing what the Word of God says and living out the precepts that are found in the Word of God. It's doing what the Spirit whispers to us to do, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, obeying God's Word, and prayer. Prayer. It's also this, though. It's, this, it's the idea of depending completely on God. Jesus himself says, With, without me, you can do nothing. You see, church family, I, us, we as followers of Christ, we cannot live this Christian life apart from the empowering Spirit of God. We, we cannot do it on our own. We will, we will fail every single time. We will we'll mess this thing up. It's the idea of waking up every single day and saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I depend on you today. I depend on you to help me in, in my marriage. I depend on you to help me in my parenting. I depend on you to help me in my workplace. I cannot do it on my own. It's the idea of, of walking in the Spirit moment by moment, every single second of the day. We cannot do this thing on our own. So I believe that this text, it calls us to walk by the Spirit of God and to pray a prayer like this. I, I love this song. It's an old hymn. It's called Breathe on Me, Breath of God. But I love the lyrics. And may this be our prayer today. 
Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so I shall never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. So this text, it calls us to say every single day, God, I cannot do this on my own. I depend on the Spirit of God that's dwelling inside of me to live out this Christian life. And whenever we do that, whenever we depend on the Spirit of God that is dwelling inside of us, this leads me to my next point. We will be salt and light to the world. Salt and light to the world. You see, David was salt and light to Saul. He was. David was salt and light to Saul. Saul was in misery because of his sin. But David made it better for him, and David would go on to submit to Saul, even though Saul wanted him dead. But David was always a light to Saul in Saul's darkness. And as followers of Christ, we are to be salt and light to the world as well. Jesus himself said this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. But you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So this text tells us that Christians are called to be salt and light unto the world. How is a Christian salt? How is a Christian salt? You see, church family, in the ancient world, salt was used for many reasons, but salt was used to preserve food. It was also, salt was also used to add flavor and taste. And, and Christians are salt by stopping moral decay. Christians are are salt by stopping moral filth. Christians bring flavor to the earth. Paul said that Christians are the aroma of Christ. You see, by walking in the Spirit, by by following the Spirit, living out the the commands of the Spirit and and the promptings of the Spirit, Christians change the atmosphere of everywhere they go. As we are living out this this thing called life, Every single day, depending on God, saying, God, I cannot do it. I cannot do it in this situation. I cannot do it here. I cannot do it there. God, it's only by, you, by your spirit inside of me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. As we live that out as followers of Christ in this world, Christians change the atmosphere of every place that they go. This is what David's doing here for Saul. Think about that. He's changing the atmosphere for Saul. Saul was in misery because of the choices that he had made, and David was, David was ministering to him. He was changing the atmosphere for Saul. And this is what believers in Christ do. Believers in Christ, we stand out. We had flavor. We're the aroma of Christ. We change the atmosphere of places. Whenever we go places in our home, because of the Spirit that's empowering us to live out the promptings of the Spirit, we, we change the atmosphere in our, in our workplace by the empowering of the Spirit. We change the atmosphere of students in our schools by the empowering of the Spirit. We change the atmosphere of our neighborhood, of our social clubs. Christians, this is, this is what we do. We are salt and we are light. We are light in the darkness. But all this starts by this. And this really should be our first point, but I wanted to end on it. All this starts by surrendering completely to Jesus Christ. By surrendering to Jesus Christ. You see, we cannot have his spirit until we surrender to him. Call on him. Jesus, save me. Coming to this realization that we are nothing without Christ, that we are hopeless without Christ, and then 
His Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. It's the very first thing, surrendering completely to Jesus Christ. Then His Spirit comes to dwell and inside of us, and we surrender our lives to Him daily, being empowered by His Spirit daily, and then Christ does the rest. He uses us for His glory, just like we see God using David here with Saul. We surrender, first and foremost, completely to Jesus Christ. You see, church family, without God, Saul was miserable. We've pointed that out. Without God, Saul was miserable. Why was he miserable? Well, ultimately, he was miserable because of his sin, because he chose to reject God. Dr. Stephen Lawson writes, do not be deceived. Sin will take you where you do not want to go. It will cost you more than you want to pay. It will make you what you do not want to become. And this is what happened with Saul, essentially. Because he was denying God, rejecting God. His sin took him where he did not want to go. His sin cost him more than he wanted to pay. His sin made him what he did not want to become. And church family, knowing this truth, that this is what sin does, that sin makes us miserable, that sin wreaks havoc on us. This is why it is so important for us to turn our backs completely on sin and to trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Sin never works out. Sin never pays off. Sin always kills. It always hurts. It always destroys. Sin will always take us where we do not want to go. Sin will always make us pay what we do not want to pay. It will make us become what we do not want to become. This is why it's so imperative for us to surrender our lives fully and completely to Jesus Christ who takes away the penalty of our sin. But after that, after we surrender, he, he empowers us by his spirit to live victoriously over sin. That's why it's so important, important for us to say, Jesus, it's, I cannot do this on my own. I cannot live this life on my own. I surrender completely to you. Come dwell inside of me. Give, me. give me power, empower me to do this thing called life. Jesus himself said, Truly, I truly, 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 I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. That's what Jesus Christ does. He brings us from death to life. He brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He is an amazing king. He is an amazing savior. We talked about this last week, and we'll talk about it more in the days to come, but King David points us to Christ. Jesus would come from the lineage of King David, and David essentially is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. As David was greater than Saul, guess what? Jesus, much greater than David. Much greater than David. This was written about Jesus. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And this was written about Jesus. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in, this, in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see church family, Jesus Christ, he came and he lived on this earth at perfect life, and he came to give you and I life. He came to bring you and I from death to life. He, he came to set free those who are captive in their sin. He came to set free those who are living in misery. And like Saul, there are people all around us who are, who are living in torment. As, as they have chosen to do life, 
apart from the power of God. They've chosen to do life apart from God, and they are living in misery. You see, one cannot have true joy or, or hope or peace apart from God. It is not there. And Jesus Christ, He came to set you and I free from the misery of sin. He came to set you and I free from the captivity of sin. And today, we don't have to live in misery. The world does not have to live in misery. Today, we can live victoriously because of the empowering of the Holy Spirit that is dwelling inside of us. But again, it starts by completely surrendering to Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. Saying, Jesus, without you, I'm nothing. I'm hopeless without you. You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life. Coming to this realization that we need Jesus, his spirit comes to dwell inside of us, empowering us to do this thing called the Christian life. And as as his spirit is empowering us and we're depending on the spirit of God daily, we cannot do it on our own. What does he do? He uses us on this planet to be salt and light. To be salt and light and light, to be the aroma of Christ, to change the atmosphere of every single place we go. But it starts by surrendering completely to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Only he can fulfill. Saul was a very empty and miserable person. He would not surrender completely and fully to God. May we be reminded today, church family, that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He fulfills He fulfills greater than anything that we could ever possibly find on this planet. Jesus Christ fulfills. He is the bread of life. He is good. And Jesus Christ is living water. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe you're in this place today or you're watching online. And... Maybe today you've come to this realization that you're miserable. You've been trying to do this thing on this earth on your own, in your own power, in your own strength, and you've never truly surrendered fully to God. Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to surrender fully to God? Well, the Bible tells us this, that we all have sin in our lives. And the Bible tells us this, that that one sin is enough to separate us from God for all of eternity. But the Bible also says that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What are you saved from? from, you're saved from the penalty of sin. What, what is the penalty of sin? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that the penalty of sin is an eternity separated from God. But it doesn't have to be like that. You can have the hope of eternal life today by trusting in Jesus Christ. And you can pray a prayer like this. Maybe you've never surrendered, you've never surrendered your life to the Lord. And today you can pray a prayer like this in complete surrender from the depths of your heart. God, I understand that I'm a sinner. I'm hopeless without you, God. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Today I confess that he is Lord And I trust, I trust in his finished work on the cross. Thank you, God, for saving me through your son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that if you said that to God and meant that from the depths of your heart, that that you have hope. You can leave this place today with hope, with peace, satisfaction. God loves you. Send his son to die on a cross for you to pay the penalty for your sin. And you can leave this place with hope, being empowered by the Spirit of God to help you to live victoriously every single day. 
And today, if you said that to God and meant that from the depths of your heart, the next step for you is to let us know. The Bible tells us that this is how we let the world know that we are followers of Jesus by believer's baptism. That's where you come into the waters to proclaim that you are a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And let us know. Let us know so that we can help you and lead you in that. Maybe you're in this place today and you never have been scripturally baptized. Baptism does not save you. It simply shows the world that you're all in for Jesus, that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you've never been scripturally baptized, let us know so that we can lead you in that and help you in that amazing act of obedience. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word that never returns void. A text that was written so many thousands of years ago that still has great implication for us today. Thank you so much for your spirit, your empowering spirit, your spirit that we see that was in the Old Testament, your spirit that's with us today that whenever we trust in you, you give us your spirit. So Father, help us not to grieve your spirit, but Father, help us to walk by your spirit, depending on your spirit moment by moment in every aspect of our lives. God, we cannot do it on our own. It's impossible. We'll mess that up every single time, but your spirit dwelling inside of us helps us to live victoriously. It helps us. So, Father, help us as followers of Jesus to walk by your spirit daily. And, Father, as we do that, God, help us to be salt and light to the world. Help us to be salt and light to the souls of the world. God, use us. Use us, Father, to minister to those who are living in misery right now. God, use us to lead people to Christ. Use us. God, use us in our workplaces and in our homes and our sports teams, in our neighborhoods, in our classrooms. Empower us by your Spirit. Father, help people to see us and go, man, they change the atmosphere when they walk into the place because they're walking by the Spirit. Help us to do that, God. Help us to change the atmosphere of every place we go because we're living by your Spirit. Your Spirit's empowering us. But not for us, God, not for our church, not for our glory, but for the glory of you, for the glory of the Son of God. He's a good God. He's an amazing God. He brings us from death to life. He sets us free from the misery and captivity of sin. He fulfills, he satisfies for his glory, not for ours. We build our hope on Jesus Christ alone. We love you, God. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Church family, would you stand to your feet as we proclaim this truth about our Savior, Jesus Christ, today?